Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everybody tonight to Brian Brown's uh, For those that don't know me, I'm Ryan Williams, one of the Chiefs. It's going to be the first of a series of talks with the Chiefs this year. Thank you for coming. I hope to entertain you tonight. Um, my talk will be over the history of NFSA treatments for factory mineral and um, And I picked this talk for several reasons. I want to assure you that no one here inspires me. Um, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was just no one inspired me. Uh, no, all so, so I, I like. I, thought, I wanted to take a, a fun, entertaining topic. Uh, I like history. I like memes. I thought we could put this together and kind of make it an entertaining talk. Uh, so, for now, end of the talk, uh, several things I'm going to go over is kind of starting over is what is the definition of quackery and uh, other key uh, important things to understand. Why I'm giving this talk. We're going to talk about the evolution of patent medicine, including the roles of the AMA, FDA, and FTC involved in this. And go over some historical examples of that, and then bring it into a modern context about why it matters. Uh, I have to thank Dr. Jackler on this, because this was actually a very broad topic, and he helped kind of guide me through this and provided me with a lot of resources to kind of be here tonight. Um, and again, when I cover this topic, I'm mostly going to speak over 18th to 20th century English literature, and I'm not going to talk about alternative medicines or alternative treatments. Tribal medicines, Native American medicines, but kind of into the English literature. Um, and mostly in you know, the medicinal context, we're not going to talk about surgeries and procedures. So, when looking at where does the word quack uh, originate from, it originates from a Dutch word. Um, during the Renaissance period, uh, mercury was peddled as a cure for uh, syphilis and then later for everything else. So, uh, quacksilver originated from, from quicksilver and mercury, which they used often during that time. Uh, also, uh, charlatan is another word that's used to describe quacks. Anais is not here, so I wasn't going to try to put the butcher in French words. Uh, but a charlatan talks a good game, but can't really produce. Again, looking at breaking the word down further, we're looking at Dutch. Quicken is like a louder voice of sound. Uh, quacks are sort of styles and remedies. And shortened, it was shortened to quack in English. So looking at what is quack, we know it's a sound that a, that a duck makes. Or also, uh, but an unsound doctor makes us use ducks out of town uh, as people are chasing. <laughs> uh, we're looking at another that the Congress defined what a quack was. So they defined it as anyone who promotes medical schemes or remedies known to be false or which are unproven for profit. And I, and I like to think that if you took medical out of it, you could actually think of what makes up Congress. <laughs> <laughs> uh, again, going back to, to the, the definitions and the, the law, semantics matter. Um, so a lot of these things are kind of vague, but this is kind of how the FDA looks at what things are. So food is, uh, articles used as food or drink for man or animals, and that includes chewing gum or anything that makes that up. Dietary supplements are labeled as a dietary supplement. They, they do not replace a meal, and then they're made up of a few things that we kind of apply to bins, uh, dietary elements, herbs, or amino acids, metabolites, or anything that kind of makes that up. Again, that's, these, are, these definitions are important for later to understand. Uh, cosmetics, um, articles related to promote attractiveness or alter the appearance that can be rubbed, poured on various ways, external almost of the time. And drugs are, are used uh, for diagnosis, cure, or treatment, and they alter the function of, body, of the body of animal or man. Uh, it's, that's a legal definition. I think it's a, a medical definition that we all understand. A drug is a substance that is intended to a guinea pig and used in scientific paper. <laughs> Uh, another funny definition of looking at a physician, uh, one of whom we set our hopes and ill and our dogs went well. <laughs> okay. So we're all groomed in the scientific process, and that's how they advance modern medicine. So you, you state a hypothesis, you test it by, by designing a study, uh, you analyze our results, and you hopefully share that with everyone to kind of you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit of knowledge. The quack doesn't do that quite the same way. So they present false health claims uh, that confuse the public and the lay people, uh, present a focus focus models of health and mankind, create fear of everything else except for their product. They try to identify with the victim in hopes of selling that, offer a false hope to cure that, and then uh, they want to cash in on that, so they make an organization to sell that. So again, what, what is a quack? Is a, is a quack someone with medical knowledge or, or non-medical knowledge? Is it someone that's offering unproven therapies? Um, <laughs> what I think of that is someone that is, uh, they don't have to be medically, 
It can be either medical or non-medical, but they're offering false claims. They try to um, uh, give off a product they know that doesn't work. So the, so the training itself doesn't really matter. So when we looked at how facts are advertised, there's a certain common things that, that are present to everyone. Um, so and major things. So they appeal to people's vanity, uh, offering individualized treatment, uh, self-treatment, home treatment. Um, also, it's again, uh, offer, making up fake diseases that they treat, and then uh, trying to turn pay, uh, these people into, uh, some people offer testimonials because we all, all want to share some of our personal good experiences. So in doing that, uh, these people become sales, sales men and sales women for them. So here's a historical picture of kind of what you think about Quackery, or, or, or old sayer, um, this man standing on top of a building in front of a large crowd selling his, his uh, uh, product. Magazines or editorials were also used during that time to sell things to people. This was a common way of communicating it, uh, passing a knowledge. Again, this person is uh, in a wagon, as we you know, can think of something going from town to town. Here's one of the ads showing uh, someone with very false extravagant, extravagant claims. A wonderful medical discovery that cures all diseases. He's a famous doctor, discoverer, and scientist. 18,000 were cured last month. All diseases treated. You can do it at home. <laughs> Vanity. I particularly like this one. Um, so, great, greatest discoveries of the 19th century. There's a steamship, there's a railway, automobile. And of course, this consumption of uh, remedies that you can treat throat and lung chest diseases. And again, equating their, their product with great uh, discoveries. In this ad, this, this fellow here looks old and decrepit on the left after he's taken this uh, uh, remedy. Without a doubt, he's been. <coughs> Tall and uh, you know, in much better health. Taking Parker's tonic again. This gentleman here is not doing so well. Looks like he's on a deathbed. Um, <laughs> this gentleman over here has you know, steak or chicken. He's very fat and portly, and formed uh, some of this room. But he looks up and get over this. Tell me. Uh, again, another ad showing death being grasped, grasped in this guy's paws, and he's actually beating him with the remedy itself. <laughs> <laughs> That's his weapon. And false hopes or, and fear. So this this is an ad showing a big bold letter: sudden death, heart disease. If you take this remedy, uh, it will help prevent that. Appealing to vanity, health, and beauty, uh, which is still you know uh, very per pervasive in our ads today. Um, love, uh, pure blood, clean complexion, sweet breath. They also used uh, people that you thought the, the public could trust, so clergymen. If you, took, if you take this uh, pure malt whiskey, it's distinguished to wine um, and tippers workers, clergymen take it, so you can trust this product. This wine, the Pope actually endorsed, or so they say, for treating influenza. Uh, depending on how you view the president at the time, uh, this ad uh, gave different responses. But if you, if you love President, president Lincoln, you can trust this product. Again, using uh, other uh, uh, war heroes, uh, this, this comrade General Grant was using this ad to say that nothing is superior to this product. You can't trust uh, clergymen, or you can't trust the government. You can trust animals, because of course they're trustworthy. One of the other uh, tricks that they used was that you, was that you could you could trick that every, everything else was a quack except this. So you could trust them because they were trustworthy. One of the other ways that, uh, that they advertised during, during these times was through uh, medicinal shows and traveling bands. So again, here's a, uh, uh, I like this picture from Dr. Jackson as well, uh, showing uh, a wagon certificate of purity so that you know that you can trust the police on there, and then a money uh, back with, if they were found, gu found guilty. Uh, so again, traveling shows, um, uh, concert groups were used to, to help uh, advertise their products. Native Americans were used back at that time because they were thought to have mythical uh, powers or do some, something else that, that, not that the, I guess, the culture people didn't know. Uh, again, another ad showing a, a, a ventriloquist show to bring in the whole family, children were invited. Uh, and uh, if you look at the, I mean, it's hard to see in some of these, but there's testimonials, uh, there's a, it says they treat liver, liver complaints, multiple diseases, and again, showing agents ever being, ever, or being advertised themselves. 
here's, a, here's a, an ad again appearing to vanity. You could be a doctor at home. You don't need a physician. Um, in this historical times, uh, for some reason, treating the man and the beast was, was, was an attractive option. So you didn't need medicine. You, just, you could treat everyone. I don't think that's the same nowadays. And this, uh, this ad again, uh, treating the man and the beast, what I like is that the yellow wrapper was for animals and the white was for human flesh. Of course, there's probably not a difference in the product. And lastly, again, another ad showing how happy the gentleman is next to his horse in the same bed. <laughs> And they both use a healing ointment. Going on to testimonials again. Um, these are these are quite funny. Um, so this is a magazine showing the testimonial for Mr. Hawker that the product he took, ten herbs, ended his health ills. Unfortunately for him, his obituary was in the same. <laughs> <laughs> as well as uh, for this lady, Ms. Kimber, again, uh, advertising and turning the patient to a salesman. If you look further on. Our obituaries in the same uh, ad. So now that I've, I've told you a little bit about some of their tricks they use, let's, let's go into the evolution of patent medicine and how uh, the, the AMA, FDA, and the FTC came into, into being at various times as well. Again, we're looking into mostly the 18th to 20th century in, in the, um, English literature at least. So in uh, 1847, the AMA was founded by Nathan Davis. Uh, he was at the age of 31 in Philadelphia. This was important for standardizing physician. Uh, what a physician is, uh, standards for uh, education and uh, medical ethics during that time. In the mid 1800s, most of the drugs in the United States were, they were imported and uh, there were some standards. And so uh, AMA recognized that the danger at that time existed. Uh, there was no, and most of the, law, the drugs at this time were regulated at a, at a state level instead of a federal level. So the 1848 Drug Importation Act was the first law at a, at a federal level to look at that. And this came into to being for two important reasons. Uh, Louis Beck was a physician at the time that wrote uh, an article detailing uh, don't trade the substances and the dangers, the danger of that time. And in 1848, the Mexican-American War was, was happening. And a lot of uh, soldiers said at that time it was attributed to, to adulterated substances. Um, and this led to this act. However, it was ineffective because it took the to enforce it. And there, there was a rise in uh, patent medicines at that time. And a patent medicine is a medicine for self-diagnosis and treatment with a secret recipe. That's, that's what I'm referring to. So the AMA established a board to help uh, educate the public on it at that time. Around this time as well, uh, President Lincoln um, uh, uh, hired the first uh, chemist into the new Department of Agriculture. And that was important because this was a predecessor to the Bureau of Chemistry, which is the predecessor, predecessor to FDA, as we know it today. In 1883, Dr. Harvey Wiley became the chief chemist, and he's uh, one of the founding fathers, really, of kind of the ideals of the FDA, as we know it today, and pushed a lot of the agenda of uh, the mental laws that, that, that affected change. Again, most of the, the, the people at this time, only public, uh, received their information through editorials and magazines, so founding of, of JAMA was important, and Nathan Davis was the first editor. Looking in the world timeline, that was key at this event. Uh, in the 1890s, German scientists discovered uh, diphtheria antitoxin, and that was important for public health. However, it wasn't standardized and manufactured the same way in every place. And most of these toxins are these vaccines were received through horses. Unfortunately, one of the horses at that time was infected with uh, tetanus, and so uh, people died and got ill and sick, mostly children, from getting, getting um, anti. Uh, a diphtheria antitoxin that was infected with tetanus as well during that time. So that led to the Violence Control Act of 1902. It was another federal law that attempt to uh, standardize the production of vaccines and um, for these disease prevention measures. However, despite that happening, uh, manufacturers continued to sell unsafe <coughs> drugs and foods, and uh, this, there was no really standards for advertisement. Uh, the uh, patent medicine industry at this time had, had considerable influence and had what were called red clauses, which were muzzle con uh, muzzle board contracts with uh, the uh, newspaper agencies. If, and if their uh, medicine became illegal during the uh, at any time by state law, they voided their contracts, which you know get a lot of money. So they so these uh, magazines and actually lobbied against laws for the students' time. And Miss Winslow's student sir, um, again, this is showing a nice child with her mother because he's teething. I was actually uh, morphine, and so. 
So, so why did that medicine proliferate so much during this period of time? And there's several factors. So in, in the early 1800s, it started off as a $3.5 billion industry, or million, sorry, and multiplied quite a bit by the early 1900s. The reason for that was because there were countless elements that we didn't have good treatments for, so people were seeking them. The population was growing rapidly. Um, they didn't, most people didn't want big government involved in, in their most daily life things. Media again, we'll tell you about the red clause, and there's antagonistic feelings toward physicians at that time. However, again, things did prevail uh, with the law and regulation, or attempted to be. Uh, Samuel, uh, the Coddlers, National Weekly, and Upton St. Jungle of St. Clair were uh, two key uh, uh, publications that came out that detailing a lot of the problems in the food and drug industries, and the public paid attention to them. That led to more regulation of the of or patent medicines at a federal level, and they attempted to standardize things to correct some of those, those problems. In the AMA in, in 1930, um, sorry, 1913, the propaganda department was established uh, with, a, with, again, the help of trying to educate the public on fraud and quackery. Uh, this is now known as the Bureau of Investigation, and there is a website. This, is, this, uh, this department of the AMA, the division still exists. Uh, Arthur Crampton was the director, and he's important because he helped release um, uh, many uh, uh, volumes of, of, of books related to this. And IGEA was founded around that time, which helped educate the public. And some of my information today actually came from some of these, these uh, books. The Federal Trade Commission was also established around this time. And uh, the, the Federal Trade Commission was established to uh, uh, promote fair business tra uh, practices. And, what was important at this time around 1925, William E. Humphrey was, was appointed by President Coolidge. And he was important because when trying to improve the way business was perceived, he uh, targeted packed medicine because he didn't think that the public had, public had a lot of mistrust because of that. Going into what he did, um, Marmola at the time was a, was a fat reducer. Um, key things to note was that obesity was not considered a disease at the time. And the ingredients of marmola were desiccated thyroid from animals and laxatives. So you yeah, imagine it was pretty effective when people were using it. And others, not uh, active ingredients, but the ingredients changed daily based on uh, the price prices around that time. So you can see in this ad that there's an obese sister here who's going home or going to bed by herself while her inner sister is going on a date. So uh, again, this, the best company was targeted by the FTC, um, and in 1931, uh, the FTC successfully got them to stop advertising. However, it was later uh, uh, overturned in the by Supreme Court because they didn't meet their burden of proof to show unfair practices as far as monopolizing the industry. The 1938 Miller Lee Act came and amended it also include advertising, and that's and, they, and the FTC actually won in 1942, and that's kind of led to some of the modern practices that we have today. That's, these are landmark cases for the FTC. <coughs> Moving back to the Pure Food Drug Act around 1937, despite, again, the recurring theme of disease, despite federal laws being passed, manufacturers trying to find ways to work around it. Uh, and sulfanamalide came out around that time and was marketed as an anti-infective wonder drug and, and killed many people because it's, uh, when it was analyzed, it was actually the same thing as antifreeze. So this led to the, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, which is, again, a founding opponent of the FDA, as we know today. This is Theodore Roosevelt signing it in. No, um, Franklin. Franklin. Uh, Franklin. Franklin. Sorry, Franklin Roosevelt. Oh, sorry, uh, signing it in, um, and uh, it required it, it, it sending control to therapeutics and cosmetic devices, outlaw false claims, and again, really standardized key concepts of uh, the FDA as we know it today. Again, a recurring theme, despite these federal laws being established. Uh, we're all familiar with thalidomide. Uh, thalidomide came out in the early, around the early 1960s and uh, was marketed uh, to help with insomnia and anti-nausea, so pregnant women were taking it, and that led to many birth defects. So this amendment uh, was made to help expand FDA regulations over advertising and regulations of uh, requiring proof of effectiveness. Okay. Now that I've, that I've kind of told you about the history of kind of how we've gotten to some of the modern regulatory functions of, of, of the FDA, FTC, and AMA. I'm going to give you some historical examples that relate to oral laryngology uh, in general, but um, they're fun. As long as the medicine has been here, there have been people wanting to cure problems <coughs> of practice. 
Here's an ad showing a sage and sulfur hair store, and I like to point out that this is, I feel like it's like watering trees. Over five months, he starts out with a bald head. In my maze, it's a full set of hair. And a beard. Yeah, these things are just filling out for him. Going to this ad, again, another one thing. Uh, detailing uh, another cure for baldness. When they analyze the components of this, it was actually 93% water, 6% alcohol, and with, with uh, a few other mixed ingredients. Very sugars for hair was also a similar thing. Uh, uh, another bold claim for uh, curing baldness, but with a mixture of uh, mostly 97% alcohol and a few other uh, scattered ingredients. Well, before all is bad. This kind of medicine ad was actually quite funny because it says, do not place this preparation on any part of the body where you do not wish it to grow because it was so effective. <laughs> not only did, were there uh, solids and remedies for that, there was these, these caps that were guaranteed by the bank. And the back, Evans' backing cap was a uh, was basically a massage, massage the scalp and would claim that it claimed that you use this several times a day that your hair would grow. I don't know how to show that. Another use that, that you probably didn't know existed for advertising was cocaine. was used to, to cure dandruff, and also, if you look at this lady, this, this top bed had a full set of hair related to use of her cocaine. Tapeworms were advertised. I'm sure these were effective uh, to uh, cure fatness. Um, not used today. This ad had a 100% guarantee that as you, if you wore this custom-fitted ear stimulator that you would be able to control your, your effort, your, control your appetite effortlessly. Moving on to facial devices, because as long as there's, again, in these devices, people have wanted them. Um, actually, it's not a device. Arsenic was, was marketed during this time to, uh, to, to, to uh, get rid of freckles and, and have a pale complexion. Unfortunately, it, it, it regularly killed its users and led to blindness. Uh, not only for, for men, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, not only for women, but it was, was made for men as well. And again, claiming it was safe arsenic. Here's a device I found quite funny for it. Why, why do you need a, a facelift when you can use this curves of juice that pulls the cords, produces chills? Here's a dimple machine that was designed. <laughs> I didn't find anyone that could specifically use this, but this may work. Uh, this, this was a, a, a quite interesting design. Uh, looks like Hannibal Lecter's mask, but again, it's supposed to uh, again, tighten the face, make you look under reduced wrinkles. It recently just came off November, so I think this would be uh, popular. Uh, again, before the use of this, there was enough mustache after using it. Nice, strong mustache, only for five minutes. Why do you need rhinoplasty when you can have this device that, that treats uh, crooked noses or with cerebral deformities? Again, here's another ad showing that again before uh, denoting an over rotated tip, but afterwards perfectly straight. Here's a German ad showing in multiple sets of noses. This device has lots of screws and adapters on it. Uh, and here's a picture of this gentleman wearing it. Came along this cure, so I had to put it in the talk. Called Dr. Williams' Pink Pills for Pale People. <laughs> 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 Any idea what, what, you, what you think this might have done? Can. Can, yeah. No, actually, I'll tell you. So, uh, in this ad, this woman apparently was able to do her day's work before, and my uh, pink pills for pale people uh, uh, helped her get back to doing surprising her husband because she was able to work at home. It also cured ataxia, uh, neuralgia, nervous headaches, and weakness of all forms in male women. So around this time also, or in the early 18th century, uh, when x-rays were discovered, radium was used for all sorts of uses. Uh, so Dr. Rupert Wells, who was hardly a doctor, uh, described using this to treat cancer of all forms. And it's again saying for internal use only. So what he actually took was a uh, mixture of alcohol and, and tonic with glue uh, that had a bluish fluorescent glow, and he took and uh, was prescribed to some patients from taking one tablespoon with, with, with water, uh, one tablespoon with water before each night of the meal, 
Um, and a critic described it as it, had, it didn't contain exactly as much radium as dishwasher and had the same therapeutic powers of treating cancer. <coughs> when medical use, there's actually a few medical uses for radium that were used in this time. So this is a nasopharyngeal radium applicator. Uh, radium was actually used uh, to reduce adenoids. Uh, it was also used in people with like, redundant surgery for tonsil. Uh, they couldn't probably surgery for tonsillectomies. Basal cells, there's also use to treat uh, nasal polyposis and allergic rhinitis. This ad uh, describes using radium sulfate rather than radium bromide because it could treat, uh, cure any disease, tuberculosis, or cancer, and said $15 worth of radium bromide was, was uh, sorry, radium sulfate was worth, was worth $50,000 worth of radium bromide. And the truth is they were really pretty worthless. Radium was also used in other uses, so it could cure your uh, cancer, but also was used to treat uh, men with uh, that needed help with joyous vitality. <laughs> uh, radium was put in baths as well, so you could you could take a bath uh, with, with your own one radium one. Uh, hmm? bath salts. Could you go back one slide? Sure. What's that stuff called? Nutex? <laughs> <laughs> Is that real? <laughs> okay, I just wasn't sure I read no, it correctly. Thanks for, thanks for drawing. Thanks for drawing. <laughs> I, I pay attention to the little details. That's what I do. <laughs> little details. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, it's real. Shade. You're using bath salts. Uh, radium is also, if you can only, if you can bathe in it, you can drink it as well. Um, so this was, uh, who would want a, a, a water cooler at work with radium in it? It was, it was uh, touted to treat goiter, uh, kidney trouble, heartaches, hay fever, uh, rheumatism, gout, diabetes. Radium also had some uh, role in treating ear disease at that time. Um, so here's a hearing aid uh, with supposedly with radium in it that was touted to cure deafness. And here's a little picture of it showing the cylindrical part was, was inside the ear with the curved part of it and the concha. Um, again, not very effective. The vibraphone was, was supposed to be a uh, upgrade from that and had a vibratory piece. Um, like this company uh, would sell it for $15 for a pair and then you could return it with it there for half off or get half your money back. So that's how they got their, that was their scam. So moving to the cold cures headaches and pain. Um, look at some things there. So this was a, uh, well, uh, ammonium chloride inhaler. This company marketed for treating Loss of voice, and asthma, and hay fever. But you can't read the ingredients for this, but this is for cold, it's called, it's called BQR, BQR. The ingredients in this were alcohol and chloroform. So I'm sure that was very effective. Uh, cocaine was marketed for treating as an instantaneous cure for toothaches, and you saw it earlier. <laughs> there was Medicaid electricity. How could you get any better than that? Uh, care the entire part of the system. Hay okay. fever, colds, as much you can carry in your pocket. Oh, this is one of my favorite ones that was in here, uh, called One Night Cough Syrup. This is great. Uh, because you're either going to have the best night one night of your life. But now it's all going to be more far and more Oh my gosh. Uh, this one uh, is in Kentucky's finest whiskey. Uh, they claim to be able to stop colds. Okay, moving back to cocaine, it was popular. Um, this was, these were cocaine ointments for sores, throats, uh, again, asthma, hay fever. Uh, the that name, Allen Cocaine, that was a good uh, company name. Uh, even, even reputable pharmaceutical companies, Bayer, used to put, her would put heroin and aspirin. Um, again, I'm sure that was also effective for stopping coughs. Here's a list of cures um, that were listed on the left. And here was actually what was in them, morphine. Coming up to ears, there, there was a whole host of ear stuff that, could, that we could talk about just in the presentation of itself. The hearing aids like hearing, deafness, uh, tinnitus, and all sorts of things. We're only going to focus on a few here. Um, so, uh, Actinet was a, uh, a, a device developed by the New York London and Ear Association, uh, or sorry, Electric Association. It was marketed as a magno electric battery uh, that, that not only cured deafness, but cured blindness for $10. Um, and one of the uh, again, critics of this said he hoped he lived in hope of seeing Actina give a test of applying blind marrying to one end and uh, deaf mute to the other and carrying both at the stroke of five dollars. Uh, great test. 
here's a cross-sectional image of what it looks like. So um, here's the piece that you would put uh, into your nose to cure your deafness and your eyes to cure your blindness. There are two screws that you would take off. We'll talk about how it was used. In it, uh, one of the secret ingredients was oil of mustard, which was considered a poison at that time, mustard oil. Here's one of its ads, again, showing that it, it cures 95% of all cases, just to give you 5% of cases that it didn't work, and cured a you know, variety of ailments here, sore throats, bronchitis, asthma. And here's one of the ads showing how it, uh, mark, how it mark, was marketed to people. Um, at the bottom of the ad, you'll notice that it says, uh, for $10 in one instrument, you will cure 50 or more persons in the family. So it seems like a good deal to me. Um, because it was, a, it was a battery and uh, works on the ozone, which is what it claimed, uh, you needed to recharge it at least three times a year. So one of the experts to get people to keep uh, sending them back if you get money. Here's directions on how to use it. Um, so what you would do to use this is you would take screws, put screws off both ends. Uh, you would place the larger into your eye, and you would, you would hold it there until your eye started burning. That's how you get it working. And then you would... Uh, Take it to your uh, to your nose and sniff it in until it started burning as well. So that's how you knew it was working. You use that six to twelve times a day. Uh, so th this Clifford Powell character here was uh, was was, uh, was a riot with uh, he defined what factory is. So he, he uh, claimed that he uh, that he treated uh, deafness and tinnitus, and he um, uh, claimed he was a doctor as well. Um, he uh, used a lot of uh, claims, again, big, large, false claims. His catchword was electro-vibratory, and I'll show you the machine that he used afterwards. He had religious sponsors that sponsored him, editorials and magazines, um, and he had a depreciating scale of, practice of, of, of prices for his product. So what he would do is he would cut off this advertisement um, telling you to send no money, and then he would send out a pamphlet with information about how he treated it. And based on how, how quickly you were to, to believe him and, and buy it, would send you a host of letters, and he would send some people up to 15 letters uh, with detailing prices and trying to identify what the victim was. Here's a picture of one of the uh, again, ads in the magazine as well, and here's a picture of his machine, which we'll go over. Uh, real life picture of his machine, uh, getting lots of uh, letters. I tried to look at the instruction uh, on how to use it, and I was actually confused myself. Uh, but you would, you would put these two, uh, these were to what looked like stethoscopes, and you would, put, and you would wet them and put them in your ear and turn some levers, and apparently that's what he said worked. Here's a picture of uh, looking inside the case, uh, showing where he based the operations were sent to people. And, uh, again, uh, he would try to individualize the treatment to them. Uh, and here's a piece of, piece of go in the ear, uh, the battery that was inside. Of course, for this, he said that you should only use his battery, because that's what worked. <coughs> Sorry, it worked. Uh, again, here's another picture of electricity uh, and related to this. I found this device very interesting because it looks like a, a belt with suspenders and a, something that choked on your neck and it goes to your ears. And again, this cure deafness and again, a host of other things, uh, amenorrhea, debility, neuralgia, insomnia, all these things are cured just with this one device. Okay, so we're going to move on to the modern context. So I've told you all these things. Uh, why does it matter to us? <coughs> Uh, so in the, in, the, in the age of the internet that we know that people now have unparalleled access to the internet and with that has come, well, has come direct access from, from companies to advertise directly to them. So uh, they have, as, as physicians, it's part of our jobs to help them sit through all this information. And a lot of things that, that they can take over the counter as supplements affects um, our management of their, of their medical problems. Um, and some supplements in this day of age is kind of what I would say are close to what patent medicines were to that time. And the supplement industry, so in 2010, uh, consumer, consumer sales were about $25 billion for, for supplements. And over uh, one of the group of studies I'm looking at this is most people over the age of 19, over half of them have said they, they take supplements, at least one. So here's a, a, a uh, advertisement that's, or, that some people may remember.
Vitamin C, you know, like in oranges. <laughs> if you don't want to lose your vitamins, make the FDA stop. <coughs> Call the U.S. Senate and tell them that you want to take your vitamins in peace. If enough of us do that, it'll work. So they actually had stricter, stricter regulations than do now. They actually required pre-market uh, pre approval from the FDA. So they, the companies had to show studies that they were safe and efficacious for patients. So that, so that got laxed over time. And uh, I don't know if any of you remember L-tryptophan. Uh, what was marketed, it's, it's a serotonin um, precursor. And it was marketed as a supplement during this time. And people, uh, a lot of people got sick and there was eventually deaths related to over, uh, taking too much of the supplement. Uh, so there was a call at that time to, to enforce stricter regulations on supplement industry at that time. Uh, that uh, advertisement you just saw was the response of the supplement industry uh, to the public to try to get them to lower Congress's um, effort to regulate them. And it, unfortunately, it worked. So the Dietary Supplement Act came around this time, and it did a few important things, like define exactly what a supplement is. I think most of us can agree that a supplement is, <coughs> well, it's, it's not a food, it's, it's more closely related to a drug because they do have properties that are active. Um, so new dietary ingredients were defined as um, anything after 1994 would require some FDA approval. Um, they have stricter lab, uh, regulations on labeling <coughs> the label as a dietary supplement. And if you look at the back of, of most uh, FDA, uh, supplement bottles, they have a, a small disclaimer saying that um, this, this did not prevent, cure, or treat diseases, and this has not been um, uh, promoted by the FDA. So the FDA has not said that this, this product does what it says. But um, despite all this, um, most uh, supplement bottles do say things like promote and support, and things that kind of so, kind of suggest that they help with treatment. So despite again the recurring theme in, in laws there in history is that despite uh, reaction reactive laws and federal uh, regulations. Things continue to happen. So, ephedra, I don't know how many of you have, have people remember ephedra in the 90s. Uh, ephedra uh, was a supplement that was put out to uh, help increase uh, athletic performance. And despite that, uh, this being on the market, it has um, strong cardiovascular mortality and associated risks and strokes. Uh, Hydroxycut was marketed at this time as a, as a, as a weight uh, to lose weight. Um, and people uh, died from had, had liver failure, and also ephedra was part of that. It took the FDA 10 years to get it off the market, despite knowing uh, it's all problems with it. 2006, Congress tried to rectify that with the, with the Dietary Supplement Non-Prescription Drug Consumer Protection Act. And that was put into place to uh, force companies to report adverse events, which are defined here. Uh, problems with this is that if adverse events aren't reported directly to the company, they don't have to say it. And we, we all know that sometimes there are minor adverse events that happen medications that in, not in this group have to, has to be reported and, can't take, and can't, things that are carcinogenic can't take time and to prove a positive effect is kind of hard to do that. Um, so again, moving to the modern day, um, Dr. Oz is someone that you know, we're all aware of and have heard of his show. Um, for looking at his credentials, he's actually the vice chair of, of surgery at Columbia and a cardiothoracic surgeon. He has a show that markets things for people. So here is a, a recent this is standard fare on the Dr. Oz show. And now I've got the number one miracle in a bottle to burn your fat. And today, senators asked, really? Three weeks ago, I quote you, FBX literally flushes fat from your system. In January, you called Forskolin, quote, lightning in a bottle. I don't get why you need to say this stuff because you know it's not true. So why, when you have this amazing megaphone, and this amazing ability to communicate, why would you cheapen your show 
by saying things like that. I actually do personally believe in the, in the items that I talk about in the show. I, I passionately study them. I would give my audience the advice I give my family all the time, and I've given my family these products. 70% of American adults are overweight or obese, and last year, consumers spent $2.4 billion on weight loss products and services. Senator Claire McCaskill asked about all the online ads that use Dr. Mehmet Oz's name and image. This little bean has scientists saying they found a magic weight loss cure for every body type. He says he's gone to court to stop them, but the senator still wouldn't let the doctor off the hook. When you feature a pro product on your show, it creates what has become known as the Oz effect, dramatically boosting sales and driving scam artists to pop up overnight. Oz acknowledged that these advertisers might have been inspired by his flowery language. I used language that was very passionate, but it ended up not being helpful, but incendiary. And it, it provided fodder for his unscrupulous advertisers. I'm second guessing every word I use on the show right now. Oz conceded that oftentimes the claims he makes about some products wouldn't withstand the scrutiny of the Food and Drug Administration. But they don't have to. Supplements don't have to have their claims approved by the FDA. McCaskill's prescription? Dr. Oz needs to get passionate about what really... So again, so the company in this, in this ad, that, or this picture of this editorial, um, got fined $3.75 million by the FDA, or FTC, nothing happened to Dr. Oz himself. Um, and FDA has a really hard time getting market supplements off the market because they can't do anything until after they, 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 people have been hurt and they get shown proof that it's caused by the supplement. So how does that, how does that apply to our fields? I, I took a look at, you know, a few common things that we, that we look at besides sinusitis. So this is a 10 minute Google search of this. And as you can see, a lot of these things look like medicines and they're in kind of branding that looks like medicines. Uh, they, they, they say they promote sinus health, help keep the, boost the immune system, but they, and I'm not sure exactly what's in all of these things. And there's multiple products through all these things. Again, promoting clear, sino, uh, clear nasal sinuses and passages to the body's immune system. Sinus support, and they look, it looks like medicine. This is in the public sees. Uh, the tinnitus, uh, there's, uh, there's, keep going, how many products there are for this. Tons of products for all these things. And again, this, this affects our management of things. And the, again, the claims don't have to be approved by the FDA. A lot of things can get put on these things and marketed to promote things. And again, I think this is the new area of, of factory and medicine. And if you think it's just on the internet, it's also in our, our own fields of like the bulletin. You know, we all get this, not all of us, but it's in our mailbox. Here's, a, here's an advertisement for tinnitus that's in some kind of somewhat of a medical journal. So, so again, uh, when, I, when you look at all these things, as Albert Einstein said, it's kind of he's doing the same thing over and expecting different results. But uh, I think the FDA in America at least needs to be regulating these things a bit more closely because uh, patients can get hurt from them. In Europe, the, the supplements are regulated much more strictly like a drug. Pre-market approval for their put on uh, have a lot more stricter regulations. But uh, for us in America, the supplements a big industry and lobbying you know, affects change. So uh, they have a lot, a lot of money that's influenced a lot of politicians to make this easier. And I think again, by educating our patients on it and kind of you know paying attention to this, that we could uh, hopefully uh, turn the table. But I think another big outcome of people being hurt will happen again in the next 20, 30 years, how things are.